today is Mr. Kazuzian's birthday, June 6, 1923. Uh, he was in the Army. The highest rank he achieved was Corporal. We are recording in Stamford, Connecticut today on, uh, on, on June 6, uh, 2011. I'm Congressman Jim Himes and represent Mr. Kazuzian in the House of Representatives. Uh, the interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Mr. Kazuzian, before we get into your experience uh, in Europe and with the 82nd, give us a little bit of biographical detail. What were you doing before the war and what led to you joining the service? Well, I had an uncle who was about 15 years older than me, and he was drafted and sent to Fort Dix. And the whole family piled in the cars and went out to visit him. And when I saw <laughs> the condition of what was supposed to be the United States Army, I, I, I felt mortified because at this time, Germany had taken over Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, England, France, and were on the gates of Moscow. It looked like nothing in the world was going to stop them. We went down to Camp Landing. We took our basic training there. We went to Camp McCall. We took our tactical training there. Well, naturally, I, in between, went to jump school, Fort Benning, where we took our jump training there. We went to Camp Shanks. And until, uh, just before Christmas of 40, 43, we were left for overseas. We went to Ireland. We spent three months there. Then from Ireland, we went to Nottingham. And we, and we had our base camp in Nottingham. And we used the base camp at Nottingham uh, for the Normandy jump and the Holland jump. But I wasn't there for the Holland jump because I was uh, captured in Normandy. I spent 10 months in the German prison camp. I went in at 175. I came out at 145. What can I say? And, uh, so you, you, you jumped uh, when the, on D-Day, you jumped behind the lines yes. with the 82nd Airborne. Yeah. And, and can you tell us a little bit about that and how, and how you were captured? We rocked out a column. Uh, by the way, uh, if you want to go into it, Ronald's wife's birthday was also June 6th, and the weather was so inclement, he figured there was not going to be a wedding. I mean, a, a party. <laughs> an invasion. So uh, he went to France, uh, Paris, brought some underwear, went to Berlin, and left Wilhelm Fowley, F A L L E Y, in charge of the whole three star general. So when our plane was misdirected, it was, we landed in, in a area near his column, and the column was wiped out, and he was in it, but we don't know that. Mm -hmm. We found out later it, it was so because one of my buddies read back to the place of scavenging through the wreckage, and he picked out a, a swastika, command swastika. It's about 10, 15 feet long, big thing. Mm -hmm. I says, Jack, I says, if they catch you, they're going to knock your head off. So anyway, I had my little 209 code converter. That was my job. I used to convert the codes into five-letter units, and I didn't want the Germans to catch it, so I buried it. I went one place, I buried my co code converter, and Jack Schlegel went to the other place and buried the swastika. And he told those people he's going to be back. Leave it there. 30 years to the day, uh, June 6, 1974. He went back to Normandy. He dug up the flag. By this time, he's bald. It took four guys to hold up the flag, and there was the flag. It and I mean, these are things I like to talk about. These are nice things, pleasant things. In Ten months in general, I, was, I lost 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And last year, when I went on, to, on, on the scale, the doctor put me at 175. It took my wife 66 years to put that 50 pounds back on me, so she must be a pretty good cook. Mm. <laughs> 66 years. Was this prison camp, was it in France or Germany? No. Where did they take right, it? No. Oh, yes. The Starlock 4B was a British camp, which most of those soldiers were captured in North Africa. And around the middle of September, I think it was the middle of September, all of a sudden we had 400 prisoners who were captured in Normandy were, were brought to that camp. The Germans decided to move us from the Elbe River to the Oder River, which is on the Polish border. And I said, this is ridiculous. They're running out of food, running out of fuel. Why are they moving prisoners? Mm -hmm. 
they were preparing for the Battle of the Bulge in September, and the Battle of the Bulge didn't happen until December 16, 1944. So they were laying the groundwork. They were moving 10,000 American prisoners from Western Germany to Eastern Germany because they knew when they break through, like the 106th Division, my buddy, I didn't know about it until maybe 20 years later, he was in the 106th Division. He got captured, and where did he go? He went to Stalag 4B, where I wished to be. When I found out, we, we said, no, we took house. Uh, anyway, it's a funny thing that the United States Air Force, who was complete control of the skies, couldn't tactically understand how you could move 10,000 American prisoners from Western Germany to Eastern Germany without them picking it up on there. Mm -hmm. yeah, this I couldn't figure out. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know about this until I got back to the United States. Then I found, I put two and two and two, two together, and I found out that, <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of guys were moved. Then, then I found out there was over 10,000 American prisoners mm -hmm. that they moved from one camp from Western Germany to Eastern Germany. But the last time I was liberated was by the Americans in Magdeburg on May, May 3rd. I'll never forget that day. Mm -hmm. They came in over the Magdeburg, they built the pontoon bridge. They came over the Elbe River with three two and a half ton trucks with white flags with no armaments, came into the camp because the German commandant was gonna move the prisoners in that camp. And it was a mixture for the first time I saw in that particular camp Russians, French, British, American, Hungarian, Polish, all mixtures. Where yeah. until that time I was either with Americans or British, nothing else. Mm -hmm. And for the first time I saw the other soldiers. With three two and a half ton trucks they came in and said, All Americans, get on. And they want to check you out. They're gonna ask you questions because Everybody there wants to be an American. Mm -hmm. And they called it R-A-M-P. Instead of saying American, recovered, recovered, recovered American POW. They couldn't say that because they don't know, because nobody had a uniform that represented any country, mm -hmm. whatever they could get. So they called it allied. So it was recovered, allied, military, personnel, ramp. Mm -hmm. Let's talk more about, uh, about coming home. Oh, uh, did, my, had you, had you my, met your wife before the war? Oh yes, we had one date. <laughs> one date. <laughs> we had one date. We had one date. And the funny thing, uh, my, the parents knew each other. So when they got the first telegram that I went, where, where had you been living here in the states? Uh, I was born in New York City. New York City. Brought up in the Bronx, mm -hmm. and moved to Connecticut because of my daughter. <laughs> she was going to take care of me. <laughs> Big joke. Anyway. <laughs> And you met your wife in the Bronx before the war? Uh, no, we, we, she belonged to the choir in New Jersey. I belonged to the choir in New York, and we switched choirs. Oh. So, uh, so uh, I took one day. Anyway, she had a beautiful voice. I married her, not for her beauty or for <laughs> cooking. She had a uh, dramatic soprano voice, such a beautiful voice. I fell in love with her voice. That's it. Huh. Yeah. Anyway, 20 years into our marriage, she got polyps, uh, and she lost her voice a little bit. So I went to the preacher who married us. I said, I should have said, I married my wife because of her beautiful voice. She said, she lost the voice. I wanted to know me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm married now over 65 years, so you see, it didn't work out that way. Now, had you uh, written letters no, back no, and yeah, forth? No, well, uh, yes, a lot yeah. of letters. But here's where you started. The first telegram we got, my mother got that I was missing in action, about two or three weeks later, Gloria's mother and her came to visit. Or was it three? I don't know where. Before, I, I wasn't there, but anyway. The day that they came to visit, they got the second telegram. And the second telegram said I was a POW. Mm -hmm. And that's when my mother said to me. These are these telegrams here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that, the second telegram said, and that's when my mother went over to Gloria. Where she? <laughs> she says, You have your bun, I said, I can be. So they started on a six month operation of trying to get me married. Would you believe it? <laughs> she was going there almost every weekend. They were playing marriage plans, and I only had one day with her. And they, all of a sudden, I got the drift in a couple of the letters about we, we're going to do this. So I said, What's going on here? You heard of a shotgun wedding? Yeah. yeah that's a shotgun wedding. 
<laughs> and it was my mother and my wife to be. I'd say back in uh, September, but making plans for my wedding. Once they found out that I was uh, alive, hmm. so that's what did that. And, and that's the best thing that ever happened to me because if it wasn't for this beautiful girl here, I wouldn't be in this condition, and I'm in good condition because I'm going to be around a long, long time. I mean, a lot of people talking 90, 100. I'm, I'm talking much more than that. But I went to see my doctor last year. He said, Harry, don't get so cocky because you could live to 121 like you think you're going to live to. But he said, up here, you may not know about it. So he says, you've got other areas that you have to worry about. That's your mental letter. So uh, let's see what happens. Yeah. His name is Bill Lord. He died, he died uh, about a year and a half ago. He had two years in Yale. Uh, he had two years in Yale. Uh-huh. And he was in, that's him right there. Oh. These are his boots. Uh -huh. This magazine, Life Magazine. Yeah, yeah, sure. This is a friend of yours over there? Yeah, he's, uh -huh. he's, he's the mortar. mortar. Bill, Bill Lord? Bill Lord, right. He that's his boots, yeah. Now, he, mm -hmm. he stayed in the Army. They wanted to make him an officer, but if, once you become an officer, you have to leave the unit. The only one that they made exception to that rule was Woody Murphy. Is that right? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. that's the only one that... Once the VE day was uh, done, he became an officer. He went, he, he's the book he wrote. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Lord wrote this book. Uh -huh. it, 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 oh, right. Right, right. Now here, here's some of the. Now mm -hmm. that's that's what the five away did. That what Eisenhower right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is the original company. Mm -hmm. Where where are you here? Is this alphabetical. Yeah. I got hit with shrapnel, uh, strafing, strafing the, the truck I was in, the German truck. The, sh the bullets hit the door, the door, and the shrapnel from the door hit me in the back. And my wife, five years after we were married, Gloria, tell her what you were doing. <laughs> she was pulling out shrapnel from my rear end mm. that was embedded. It, it took five years coming out. Mm -hmm. Could you believe it? Mm -hmm. Right. It, it kept it fusted, went through, uh, like a. Yeah. yeah and so. then she would, would. So this was you. This was Allied uh, uh, armies firing on German uh, convoys that you we, were in. We, that, no German convoys that we confiscated. Oh, that you confiscated. She right. never. We thought we were hidden, but they spotted us. So was it the Germans that were firing on no, you? No, the, the because you were in German trucks. No, trucks. Oh, right. So this was. A, I was stupid. That's. This was friendly fire. Friendly. Right. <laughs> friendly fire. Wow. Where did that happen? Normandy. Normandy. No, 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 no. Uh -huh. Yeah, near, mm -hmm. near Saint Lo. So was it, I'm interested in um, the transition into the military because you're a high school kid in the Bronx and now well, you go into one of the elite units. Yeah, was well, that that's tough, it. Was that, that a tough change for you? Yeah, it was a tough change because I'll tell you what, they put us through, we volunteered. Mm -hmm. And some of the things they put us through, I said, they would starve us. They would freeze us. Mm -hmm. I said, we're supposed to be the best. I thought they were going to treat us like elite. <laughs> and it's a funny thing, I was ready to quit when I got a telegram in, fe in jump school, it was a, the, the, about, about February 25th, my sister's getting married, and <coughs> she wants me to come to the f wedding. I've been in the Army now since December, and I, I've never, this is February, I've never even got out of camp. So the first sergeant says, uh, you want a week, week for a row or 10 days? I was surprised. I says, I don't know, a week is enough. Yeah, all very good. You sign these papers. He says, when you come back, you've got to start A stage all over again. We had A, B, and C. Uh -huh. And what they put us through, I would never do it a second time. And the only reason why I did this first time is this yokel from Mississippi said, you city boys, you can't, you can't do this stuff. And the more he kept saying that, he kept that. And I did it, but I would never do it a second time. So you didn't go to the wedding? So I canceled the wedding. I sent a telegram. I said, keep your, keep your furlough. I'm, no. Yeah. Now, there was another flaw. I don't want to go into this. <laughs> when I went to volunteer, originally, I, I, they, I was A1 for everything except I was colorblind. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. Mm. I know. So I said, what? So he said, you lack of vitamin A. So my father went out and bought a big bushel of carrots, got the machine. I was drinking carrot juice, but I was drinking carrot juice that came out of my ears. I went back again. He said, you were here with it? Yeah, I said, yeah. I said, it doesn't happen overnight. He showed me that I failed again. I said, show me what it is. Show me the colorblind book. And when he pointed it out, I was able to pick it out. Uh -huh. So he showed me first basic. I waited a little more, and I went back a third time. And this time, that was a different doctor. And I was hoping he'd start from the beginning. And if he did, he started. He said, I said, seven, five. And before he could turn the third page, I knew the next one was one. <laughs> I said one. <laughs> so you see, uh, I faked my way in. <laughs> so these are, uh, yeah. But they wanted the best. I said, well, what's colorblind is that important? What's that? So you had three physicals before they let yeah, you right, in, right. and you got in because you well, memorized the, you the eye chart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, what class can I tell you? I'm, I'm nobody. It's just that uh, 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 June 6th was my birthday, and yeah. I yelled happy. I was supposed to yell happy birthday, and I never got that. I never got that. We were a great regiment. Uh, we don't get the, the accolades like uh, the 506 that for, for uh, the, they made two pictures, uh, Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers. Uh -huh. But we trained together back in 43 in Camera Call, 506 and 508. And we were all, eight, we were all 18 and 19. We all volunteered 18 and 19. Hey, Bill Gord, he quit Yale. He was 18 and a half. He, not, no, he was 19 and a half, he could yell and join up with the 508. So when you were in Nottingham, did you meet many of the uh, of the British there? Uh, no, most, there was very little British, very little British, they were all, oh, yeah? uh, duty over there. They were on assignments. Uh -huh. but, uh, but their families were there, right? Their families were there. Mm -hmm. And some of their families would do our laundry for us, you know. We, 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 not that we wanted it, but we would go and give them a little chocolate or a little coffee or a little something on the mm -hmm. side just to be you know, help. help. Mm -hmm. And that's when I fell in love with fish and chips in Nottingham. You walk down the street, they give you a newspaper, a little up, fish to make fish with some. Yeah. And you walk from one block to the next, and they were on the rations. So we finished eating that, six pence. That's mm -hmm. 10 cents. Mm -hmm. Fish and chips with that. You walk to the next block, go to a different one. So by the time we went down, the we had about half a dozen fish and chips. So the idea was that you would be out on the battlefield communicating back to your division? Well, no, not, we, 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 went to, we went to regimental. I was battalion. Okay. Battalion had to go to regiment. It was regiment that communicated with division. Okay. See, as you went higher, the machines got bigger. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. division it got so big, they, they, could, they needed a truck to move. Right. Right. So they were coding stuff. They were coding stuff even coming from the battalion. Oh, by the way, we jumped with two pigeons. Did you know that? Two pigeons? No, tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, hook. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a cage, a round cage, uh -huh. just thick, with a canvas on it, hooked to the side. We had two pigeons. I think one was to Eisenhower's headquarters. These were homing pigeons. Must be. Huh. <laughs> we didn't ask the intake. <laughs> and one was to Bradley's headquarters. Okay. And, and we jumped with two pigeons. Huh. Yeah. Did you ever use them? Uh, <laughs> no, no. The one I had they ripped off my uh, ripped off my canister, uh -huh. so he went down. Uh -huh. But the one Hook had, they used a uh, sergeant Hook. Uh -huh. uh, I forgot to tell you. When my shoot opened, I just as it opened, I hit a tree. As the shoot opened, you hit the tree. Yeah, as it just bl bl blossomed. You told me you jumped from 400 feet, yeah. static line. Yeah. So as the shoot blossoms and you're on the ground. No. Or almost. hitting a tree. Uh, almost on the ground. Yeah. I was about 50, 60 feet up in the, in yeah. the tree. Uh -huh. Now, we, uh, we, did, we had Bay West. You know what a Bay West is? The life preservers? Yeah. We, uh -huh. we discarded that mm -hmm. because we're, hit, we're inland. The... the <laughs> Gas mask we discarded, and we discarded the, the reserve chutes, so the bladder team we returned. So, <laughs> we had the jump rope, a 40 foot jump rope. Everybody had one of those. Uh, and we had, do you know that we were issued switchblade knives? No. 
I didn't know, no. Well, that's what saved my life. Yeah. But at least he kept my jet jacket. It's up there. So you were, were you actually hung up in this tree? Well, I was hung up in a uh -huh. tree, and my arm was caught here. Uh-huh. And... No, the jump, the jump suit, the jump suit. The oh, jump the suit? The jump suit. And it's a funny thing. With a zipper, you try to do a left hand zip with a right hand, you can't do it. Uh huh. You know you can't do it. Uh huh. Right here we had a, see this here? Yeah. You had a switchblade knife. Mm -hmm. You could zip it from this side, or you could zip it from this side. So when my arm was caught, I was able to zip, I was able to open it. I got it out, uh -huh. cut away, tied, tied my uh, rope. The, and I, on my shelf now. I was still 15 feet off the ground. I yeah. dropped that. Yeah. They, we were so brainwashed that we could have go down there. We put our beautiful wool pants, khaki shirt, tie, tunic, and then we put our jumpsuit on top of that. Mm -hmm. We're going to get down there. We're going to knock out the Germans in two, three days, and for the weekend, we're going to go to Paris. This is our thing. We sit up on the 30 caliber light machine gun, and we hear. The German machine was three times faster than ours. Uh -huh. So, Sakharov. Sakharov took us. He said, I don't think we're going to see Paris. Huh. You know, they didn't tell us that. They told the machine guns were so fast. Yeah. Much, so yeah. much better. Everything they had was better than ours. The German weapons? Weapons. Uh -huh. Tanks, uh -huh. the guns, the machine guns. Yeah. You know why we won this war? And don't let anybody tell you anything. We won this war because the Germans ran out of oil, and no other reason. They ran out of oil. Mm. When they when they when we landed in Normandy, there was quite a few of their artillery pieces being washed on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the German. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a yeah. And some of the vehicles, they had wood burning stoves in the trunk with a pipe going into the into the engine like steam. They were running the automobiles on steam. Huh. You can't go fast 25, 30 miles an hour. But right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, when you saw that, yeah. you knew that they were in trouble. Yeah. And that's why we won this war. Not that we beat them. Yeah. Their terms were good. Oh. Everything they had was good. Yeah. It's yeah, just okay. that the biggest thing I could say is I said happy birthday. I shouldn't have said happy birthday because everything after that was after unhappy. Yeah. <laughs> no, everything after we jumped was negative, negative, negative. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for telling your story uh, on this and for your service. Yeah, well.